Welcome to the Gilson um, bootstrapping series for our new thing, Can You Hear Me Now? Social Media Marketing and Effective Use of Web Tools. I want to thank you all for coming out on yet another unusual summer-like night. We'll be out where you can see the windows soon, so at least you won't miss that. My name is Jennifer Gottwald, and I'm a licensing manager for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. The Gilson series began in 2004 with a gift from the late Dr. Warren Gilson. Dr. Gilson was a UW medical student graduate, faculty member, and prolific inventor of medical electronics and instruments. He was also an entrepreneur and the founder of Gilson Inc., a leading manufacturer of analytical instruments headquartered here in Middleton. In 2002, Dr. Gilson left Wharf a significant gift to promote the exchange of ideas between the university and Wisconsin businesses. He often recollected that as, as a young entrepreneur, he valued the informal conversations he had with colleagues in the cafeteria at the university's hospital. In the weeks and months to come, you'll receive notices about additional topics in the Gilson bootstrapping series. The new chapter in Wharf's Gilson repertoire began about this time last year with the goal of highlighting key elements and challenges inherent in bringing an innovative idea to the marketplace. Last spring, we focused on the fundamental topics, ranging from operational, financial, and the legal basics of starting a company to how to conduct useful market research. This year, we've been featuring lectures and discussions on emerging and nimble practices in creating new ventures. Our goal is to bring together speakers who themselves are innovators in how they approach the challenges in the rapidly changing technology sector. We're in the process of identifying a diverse lineup of presenters, so we may rearrange the topics a bit, but we'll definitely give you the dates when it's going to happen, and you can see what's going to happen then. We'll contact you by email as the events are confirmed, and you can also always check the Wharf and Discovery websites for updates. The bootstrapping series is very much in the spirit of the Gilson's vision that Wharf could do with their incredibly generous gift, namely forge new ways of bringing together the university and business communities for their mutual enrichment. This series itself is just that kind of collaboration as well. It was created through a partnership of campus and community leaders dedicated to fostering innovative ventures and advancing bold ideas. These partners include the UW-Madison Schools of Business and Law, the UW Office of Corporate Relations, the UW-Madison Small Business Development Center, BioForward, and WARF. Representatives from each of these groups are with us this evening and will be available for conversation during the networking reception following this evening's pre presentation. This evening, we're going to hear about how one local business became a global player in part by finding ways to get its message across that were as innovative and resonant as its products. Shopbop.com is arguably one of the most exciting ventures to emerge in the landscape in recent years, and tonight we'll hear from Tim Gill, traffic manager for Shopbop.com. Here to introduce our speaker is Dan Olchewski, who I'd like to thank for organizing this evening's presentation. Dan is the director of the Weinert Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Business. He teaches the Capstone Entrepreneurship Wave course and was one of the co-founders of the Wisconsin Entrepreneurial Boot Camp Program for UW graduate students enrolled in the sciences and engineering. Prior to joining the UW, Dan was CEO and chairman of Parts Now and was instrumental in increasing revenues at the company from 26 million to over 400 million. With the assistance of private equity sponsors, he led the successful buyout of the founder in 1999. Before joining Parts Now, Dan was a consultant at McKinsey & Company with a focus on strategy, supply chain, technology, and finance. He has also worked for IBM, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, and Yasuda Fire and Marine Insurance in Tokyo. Dan is on the board of First Business Bank and Solo Gear LLC. He's also on the advisory board of Parts Now LLC, and he currently serves on the nonprofit ad advisory board for the Henry Vilas Zoological Society and has served on the WHA Public Television Board. Dan graduated from the UW Madison with a bachelor's degree in economics and computer science and received an MBA from the Harvard Business School. So please join me in welcoming Dan. Thank you. It's my uh, great pleasure to uh, be able to introduce uh, Tim Gill uh, tonight. And uh, Tim is uh, a, one of those kind of classic uh, Wisconsin alums uh, who graduated 
uh, he got his undergrad here in international relations, uh, Latin uh, American studies, and uh, he went on uh, to get his MBA in entrepreneurship uh, from the UW, and has had a, a successful career in the kind of software and IT space, ranging from a web designer uh, to a uh, instructor for software and e-commerce, a uh, successful uh, search engine optimization consultant, uh, and uh, most recently, uh, joining uh, Shop, Shopabop, which is a very exciting company that has, uh, is a division of Amazon and is doing some very kind of innovative things in uh, the marketing, uh, social uh, media, the search engine optimization standpoint. And uh, Tim is, is clearly uh, the, one of the first people, if the first person I go to if I have any questions in that space because his knowledge uh, is really tops of anyone in the field and it's uh, a practical and useful knowledge and not just uh, theoretical. So it's always appreciated when we're making uh, connections and he's very giving uh, of, of his time. So please join me in welcoming uh, Tim Gill as our speaker tonight. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I feel like this is great timing because of the Isthmus article that was just out last week that some of you may have seen that profiled both ShopBop and Context, uh, a men's apparel site. So at ShopBop, we have a lot of different social media marketing things going on. We have our Facebook, our Twitter, our Pinterest, our Weibo, which is uh, we launched a Chinese site about a year ago, and Weibo is sort of the Twitter of uh, China. We have our blog, we have a Korean blog, um, and we have an Instagram. So keeping track of all of those things is one of the things uh, I uh, take interest in. I manage the way, the traffic manager role is really about managing all the ways that people discover or get to shopop.com. So whether it's through a search engine, through an email, through just typing it in, uh, I try to get as many people as possible to the website. So this is the agenda for today. Um, <laughs> everybody's getting $75 before I leave. That'll keep your attention. So first, I just want to start with general tips for startups. Um, one of the things I've, I've seen in it, as different companies start up is uh, just spending too much money too quickly. I would say, for the time being, if you've got a startup planned, skip your site for the time being and get your Facebook page up quickly because it's pretty easy. And everybody knows how to use Facebook. And it's easy to build a following. You can build a site down the road. But if you have an idea that you just want to test and throw out there and see if it sticks with people, just create a Facebook page. Anybody can do it. Um, the other interesting thing that, that I see some startups doing very successfully is jumping on internet memes. And a meme is basically anything that everybody's really into for that month until the internet loses interest in that. And one of those things is planking. How many people here have planked before? <laughs> how, many, how many people know what planking is? OK, great. Maybe that one guy who knows, who's done it before can demonstrate. <laughs> <laughs> the other one is this phenomenon of stuff people say. So you know, you, if you go onto YouTube, you can see uh, videos for stuff fashion girls say, stuff Silicon Valley people say, stuff startups say, stuff Madisonians say, stuff New Yorkers say. You can see, and I'm substituting stuff with, uh, <laughs> I'm using a euphemism because this is recorded and my mom might see. <laughs> um, so whatever's popular in your space, if you can create something that's in line with what, where the web is going and what everybody's forwarding to each other, you can leverage that popularity. Um, Kickstarter is another great place. Uh, I think of it now increasingly as a social network because it's a quick way to throw your idea up there and let everybody critique it, and maybe they'll even give you money. And really just getting your pitch down into a short sentence, like, we're like, <laughs> insert startup here, but for this. And a couple examples are Rent the Runway, which is in our space, um, which it's like Netflix, but for dresses. Or Bag, Borrow, or Steal, which is like Netflix, but for handbags. Everybody gets it right away. 
Um, the really hot thing that, that seems to be attracting a lot of financing right now are subscription e-commerce sites, and we're just taking note of that. Um, that's where you agree to give a website $39 a month, and in return, they will send you a, ba a box of your favorite shoes, jewelry, sunglasses, whatever you want. So starting about defining your customer, as, as a social media marketer, what you really want to think about is get inside of the click habits of your customer. Like, pretend you're their mouse and you're going along their daily routine. So you're thinking about like their demographic, psychographic, how they behave online, um, what platforms are they on, what kind of phone do they have, where do they hang out, what search engine is their default search engine, um, and who are the thought leaders in the space? Who are, your, who are the curators? Who are the people that decide what everybody else is going to be reading? So um, this isn't shop ops data, but this is something I pulled off the web um, from Rim Kaufman, which is a, a really a respected search marketing agency. And they aggregated all of their clients, and this is something that they saw. When they're posting ads on Google, this is the behavior that people use. How many people are surprised by that? Not too many. What, what this tells me is that there's a lot of people surfing the internet when they should be at work, if you look at the blue line. <laughs> Um, and what, what it also tells me is that when you get home from work, you don't want to be at a computer anymore. You want to be on your iPad or on your phone. And I think we all know that behavior intrinsically as we analyze our own internet user behavior, but that dictates how you need to reach people at certain times of day. So like if you want to reach somebody at 8 o'clock at night because you're selling pizza, you should probably be advertising on an iPad rather than, than on a desktop. Now, when you get more granular into that sample distribution, the other <laughs> interesting thing that you see is that the iPhone jumps up and down like a little squiggly line. And what it is is all these people that are in business meetings that are on their phones under the table <laughs> doing something that they're probably not supposed to or maybe that they are supposed to. But that also goes down and then it shoots back up when everybody's on the train um, home or on their, on their commute taking public transportation. So you see that happen about 6 o'clock. This is Eastern time. So if you're, if you're trying to reach a certain kind of person, you need to think about where they are, what they're doing, and the device that they're on, and the time of day. So where this leads to is there's sort of this gap in, in where ad spend is going and where people are spending their time. And the real inconsistency here is, is what you see there in mobile. So we're all spending more time on, their phone, on our phones. How many people have smartphones here? Yeah, so like almost everybody. And there's still lots of money flowing to print, but nobody's spending that much time in print media. So I expect this probably to correct in the next couple years. What it tells you too is that m mobile marketing right now is probably pretty cheap compared to how expensive it'll be in two years because there aren't, that many there aren't that many dollars chasing those eyeballs. So I want to talk about email briefly because it really is the original social network. It's your group of people. And before we move on to Facebook and Twitter and everything else, um, it's, it, email's still a highly effective way to reach people, and you shouldn't forego it if you're, if you're creating a startup. And one of the most important things I think about with email is that you own that list. When you aggregate a base on Facebook or on Google, Facebook owns that group of people. They're just letting you talk to them. And the Facebook changes that just happened recently are really steered towards making it so that you now have to pay Facebook to talk to your audience. That's one of the things that Timeline sort of incentivizes through some sneaky ways. Same thing with Twitter. Having a list in Twitter doesn't really guarantee that you're getting visibility. Same thing with putting email in people's inbox. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to be seen, but at least you're not paying Google or Facebook to message your people. Um, email capture is, is kind of an art form, and if you want to study email capture, like how people get your email address, how many people have signed up for a Groupon in the last year or so? A lot of people, right? So study, go back and look at Groupon and think about how did they get their email address out of your pocket? <laughs> and they're really, really clever about it. Um, search marketing is probably my area of, of core expertise and really understanding like when you Google stuff, what shows up, 
Is it a free click? Is it a paid click? And what are the right words for your business? So one of my favorite tools for this, understanding your business, is Google Trends. And it tells you some, it gives you a sense of how people search, how they discover, where they discover, what language they speak, And uh, I just queued up a couple of interesting things. So if you were to try to understand what, who's more popular, Badgers, Hawkeyes, or Cornhuskers, you could argue that all night down at the bar. <laughs> or you could pull up this chart and say, well, people have clearly searched for Badgers, the blue line, ironically, more so than they have for um, those other schools. <laughs> the other thing that this tells you, let me zoom back out a little bit. The other thing this, this tells you is that the Badgers have become more popular as time has gone on. So in the last couple of years, we've seen searches for the Badgers increase over time, telling you that our popularity has gone up, whereas you see the Cornhuskers have kind of declined. You can see that trend there. The other thing that this can tell me is where are the most closet Badger fans in the Big Ten? <laughs> Anybody gander a guess? <laughs> Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> so the data down here that's telling you subregions is telling you, I'm sorted by Badgers, so Badgers are the blue line, and it's telling me where things are searched for the most per capita. So assuming that everybody in, the, in Iowa has the same amount of internet access, you can extrapolate from this data that Iowa, or that the Badgers are searched for fairly often in Iowa. And then if you want to really nail down um, who are the biggest Badger fans in Wisconsin, who's searching the most for the Badgers online per capita, it's right here <laughs> in Madison. Now, you can take this logic and apply it to a lot of different things. So you can get a sense of where Hawkeye fans are, which I find interesting. That Iowa's obviously gonna be popular, but there's a lot of people that are Hawkeye fans in other states, like South Dakota and Nebraska, which I think it comes to no surprise. Google will also let you dive deeper and say, Let, show me a, more detailed information by state. Show me all, uh, all of the years, show me 2012. <coughs> or go into the United Kingdom and find out where all these expats are. So if I were in working for the UW Alumni Association and a fundraiser, like my wife is here, <laughs> I might look at this data and say, what cities do I want to stop off at in England? Or where should I be? If I want to try to attract Badger fans or alumni, Maybe I should go to these cities that are listed here because there seem to be concentrations of people that are searching for badgers. It may not be, it may be the animal, it may not be the sport or the team. <laughs> um, so another tool that I also really like is Google Insights for search. And the way that Google Insights for search works is it allows you to get to another level of granularity than Google Trends. So this is, you can just type in the word insights into Google and you'll, you can pull this up. And what I can do here is take that same query and categorize it by sports. So now Google's eliminating everything else that's animal related and getting down to just teams. The other interesting thing here is that you can see when something peaks in popularity. So if you're selling, like we are, Ugg boots, and you want to know when are people searching for Uggs, we all know that Ugg boots are searched for probably more in the winter when you'd wear Ugg boots than they would be in the summer. But if you don't know your market that well and you need to do research, this can really help you find the timing of your market, find where people are searching for it, find what's more popular, and the way that this ties back to social media is, is really in content creation. So when you're trying to understand, should I do a blog post about Justin Bieber or Britney Spears, and you want to know what your audience is really into, this, these tools can help you dig deep and really isolate 
what your audience cares about. The other neat thing with uh, insights is that it gives you something else, which is a little clue about what else people searched for. So you see the, um, the rising searches. You see the Badger game going shooting up, right? And that's really what Google does is it looks and it sees if something is really popular, and it pushes it up knowing that we're all searching for the Vanderbilt game or the results of it, or we're trying to find out where we can watch it. So Google shifts its algorithm a little bit to try to push that content to be the most relevant thing. It's not going to pull up the Oregon Ducks game. It's going to pull up the most recent thing. So when Google sees this, these rising searches, it tries to tap more into its news algorithm than it does into its web index. So that's Google Trends and Google Insights. Um, one thing I didn't show you is that it, it forecasts search volume. And the soccer versus football question is really fascinating to me because it tells you a lot about internet penetration. You think about where would this be the most popular in the world, and it also exposes the skew of the data. So Lesotho, according to Google, is the most popular place for soccer. And what it tells you is that of the people that are online in Lesotho and that have internet and that can use Google, they're searching for soccer more so than people in Iowa or the United Kingdom or in any other part of the world. So understanding what the data is telling you and understanding that per capita of the, and of the people that have internet, what are they taking an interest in? Fiji, I think, is the interesting one where Fijians can't seem to decide if they like football or soccer more. They're about tied. <laughs> So just be aware of that skew of the data. So creating buzz. Um, some of the things that we do at ShopUp to create buzz are really blog posts, videos. Um, lookbooks are a big thing. I think the um, we did a lookbook just recently. It got some decent buzz. And we put our lookbooks on our homepage. But this is the one, away, one of the ways that we often market is through our lookbooks. So I could talk about lookbook marketing all day, but I want to make sure that this is a relevant talk <laughs> for you guys. So I'm going to try to expand out of, outside of my comfort zone. I can't believe she dropped her ice cream. <laughs> so some of the thing, ways that you can build buzz around whatever you're doing, your startup, is being controversial. That's always a surefire way to get people talking about you in a positive or negative way. It's not necessarily the best way to run a business, though. If you're a media site, it's a great way to attract an audience. Uh, being insightful, resourceful, funny, starting a blogger is super easy. I think everybody here probably has the capability to do that, so I won't go into detail there. Creating a video, um, also really easy and even easier now with iMovie and sites like animoto.com, where you can just grab a bunch of um, JPEGs and it'll mishmash it into a movie for you within 30 seconds. And then creating infographics. And infographics are one of the new, I think, more interesting things that people are doing. I list a couple sites here. You guys can all download the PowerPoint and take a look. But I think um, in this day and age, when we're all overwhelmed by massive amounts of data, we need things that can clearly and concisely communicate a value proposition or very complex sets of data to people in an interesting way. And one of my favorites is, is the Venn diagram. And people have been creating you know, great Venn diagrams for social media marketing. And these are one of the more shared things on, pin, on Pinterest right now. Um, in our space, somebody did a, the history of leggings, uh, the CMO's guide to social media. And so finding like what your niche is interested in, what, what your audience really wants to see. And if you can create an infographic around that, that's a great way to build quick exposure for your business. Again, refer to the, the tools I put up there before. These are some of the uh, 
infographics that I've been inspired by. And then there's a great site, coolinfographics.com, that you can go to for inspiration. And when you're also thinking about, like, well, what does my audience really care about? Google Suggests or Google's Autofill feature uh, is, is a tool that will, like a good friend, complete the end of your sentence. <laughs> So to take that thought a little bit further, there's a site out there called, S S I don't even know how to pronounce this, Sovel, S-O-O-V-L-E. And what you can type in is, is shop bop. That's a branding problem, right? Legitimate, authentic. As we grow our brand internationally, one of the things we see is more and more people looking through our merchandise or they're typing into Google like, they want to know, is this site legit? So somebody in the United Kingdom that's never heard of ShopUp before wants to know when they spend $700 for a Marc Jacobs handbag, they want to know that it's authentic. So people will type this in more so in regions where we're less known than in the United States where we're better known. But it's somewhat problematic that Google suggests that. So what Suval will do is it queries Wikipedia, Google, Amazon, Yahoo, Bing at the same time. So this can give you a, a sense of what all these different engines are going to push people towards. And the reason that you want to be aware of what these engines are pushing people towards is you want to have the answer when they get there. So when that person searches for, is ShopBop legitimate? We want to make sure that we're, we have a say in that conversation as opposed to letting someone else answer that question for us. So Google suggests, and this tool, Suval, will give you a sense of where are, where are these engines pushing people and making sure that you can make sure that you are there when, they, when they're pushed there. So shop up on Facebook, uh, we had an uh, exciting announcement yesterday. We just hit 400,000 fans. And there's uh, 15,000 pe 15, people PTAT, which is Facebook's metric for people talking about this. And then stylofane.com, which is a site that we look at probably once a month, it lists all of the top sites in retail. And Victoria's Secrets is their number one. Anybody have a guess why? <laughs> if you have a fashion show like that, you're going to get a lot of likes from 13-year-old boys. <laughs> That's my hypothesis. Um, so having a big audience is great. Is it necessarily the right audience? Can Victoria's Secret sell anything to that audience or half of the people that are there? Probably not. But by what, what this is called in the industry is fan gating. So what, what Victoria's Secrets has done very cleverly is they put their um, fashion show behind a fan gate. So if you want to see it, you have to go to Facebook, you have to hit like, and then you get to watch the fashion show. Um, other brands that are here, and Shop Op is way down at like number 51, right? Just chasing J. Crew. So this stylofane site, fane with a ph, is, a, is an interesting barometer for us. It covers magazines, watches, retailers, beauty, footwear, denim, and it has these different levels like platinum, gold, silver, bronze. So if you're trying to research the space and understand who's doing what, who's being successful, this is a great site to, uh, to bookmark. So let's talk a little bit about timelines. How many people have set up timelines on their Facebook profile? Cool. Good number of people. So you know, this is probably one of the more exciting spaces. Like everybody's really excited about putting their big brand logo or whatever it is. And, and you know, you're seeing increasing degrees of cleverness about the way people integrate their profile shot, which is the lower left-hand side, with their, I don't even know what that's called, their big banner. Cover photo. Um, and I think this person at the bottom really hit the nail on the head. That, that space is going to be for sale very, very soon. <laughs> um, 
So a little bit about Facebook ads. They're the traditional Facebook ads, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, but I'm more excited, I think, about sponsored stories. So we've all been on Facebook and seen ads for like home mortgage scams or something like that. There's a lot of scammers going on on Facebook because Facebook just opened the floodgates and they said, everybody come in and advertise. And all the people that aren't allowed to advertise on Google, which is tobacco, alcohol, uh, anything pharmaceutical related, Google will not let you advertise there. So Facebook said, we'll take you. <laughs> and so everybody went there. But Facebook is slowly cleaning house, but I think they're trying to, to boost revenues a little bit into their IPO. So the sponsored story, you're, you're going to see more and more of this year where somebody checks into a Starbucks or something like that, and then you, you see Starbucks basically is paying Facebook. Whenever Starbucks is mentioned through a check-in or through anything that somebody shares, Starbucks is saying, I'm willing to pay per click to get that message, that story shared to all of that person's friends. So then you go onto Facebook and you find out that, oh, Susan went to Starbucks today. That's, that's cool. And then maybe you'll go to Starbucks, or maybe you'll check in, or maybe you'll order something, or maybe you'll get a loyalty card or something to that degree. So there's a lot of people that are really using um, the sponsored stories within Facebook in a, in a clever way. I think the more it's more at this point in time, it's really people that have a retail outlet or a store to go to, and they're leveraging it pretty heavily, and Starbucks is probably one of the more successful um, sponsored stories that I've seen. And then story types. So like, if, if you're creating a Facebook ad and you're creating a, a story type, these are the four different kinds of, of things, stories that you can create. So one goal could be acquiring more fans for your brand or engaging more or driving more s traffic to your store, the Starbucks tactic or increasing app engagement, so getting people to download your Facebook app. One of the things I find most interesting about Facebook, though, is from a startup perspective, you're really thinking about market research, trying to understand how big is my market size. And I remember taking classes with Dan, and we had, have, we had to estimate the market size for a glue that would dissolve in water. <laughs> that was developed here at Wharf, that, we have a, that the university had a patent to. Um, that was really hard, that was a really hard project. But Facebook makes it easy. So using ad segmentation, you can go in and you can just type in the United States. And Facebook will tell you, we have that many million people in the United States. This is how many are men and this is how many are women. This is how many are single, relationship, or engaged, or married. This is how many are speaking these languages that live in the United States. So if you're creating a product or a service that's targeting Portuguese Americans, <laughs> there's 147,000 people in your market that you could target on Facebook. So finding your niche, um, this is where it gets really interesting. You can aggregate all of these different metrics to really narrow down, I want to target teachers in Facebook. Well, all of those things are the kind of people you want but maybe you're just really interested in the primary school teacher because you have a great children's book that you want to be promoting. Um, engineering, wedding photography. And the beauty of Facebook is it's telling you how many people it has, and then it's letting you take an ad and put it right in front of those people's audience. So no matter how niche your field is, biomedical engineering or um, some obscure science that I, that I don't understand, You'll probably find a community in Facebook and a fan page, and you could get your message in front of those exact right people. So now the big question. <laughs> How many people have done Pinterest or pinned something? A decent, a decent show of hands. So um, a lot of people wonder, should you be on Pinterest? And I think the question is, do you have time for uh, another <laughs> social network? And if you do, do I have the Pinterest site for you? <laughs> so as I mentioned before, I'm a huge fan of infographics. I think the biggest question about Pinterest and whether or not you should be there is are you trying to target women or men? And if you're trying to target women, I think based off of Facebook's records for the, the demographic breakout of Pinterest, they pointed to about a 97% female split. So if you're trying to target men, 
Um, Pinterest is probably not the place to go, but this whole infographic can walk you through some of the logic. So I just wanted to leave you guys with some resources and, and think about content and aggregation and curation. Um, I used to use Google Reader and a, a variety of RSS feeds. I've shifted to a site called Alltop because Alltop will take all of the blogs that write about a given subject matter and it will aggregate them all. So you can just peruse the headlines at your leisure. And let me just show you guys a quick example of that. And this is both great for, from a consumer perspective, but also from a marketing perspective. Um, it, wasn't, it was a low amount of effort to get ShopBop's blog listed here on the fashion all top. But what I can do here is I can get a sense, just by scrolling through, all of the top sites and what they're talking about on any given day. And then using the control find, I can see how many people are actually talking about ShopBop. And I can see that there's four matches. So if I wanted to know a sense of realistic buzz about every day in the blogosphere, who's talking about ShopBop, I could just go to the site and say, oh, there's four, four bloggers that mention ShopBop in their headlines. They might be mentioned somewhere else, but I think that um, as you look into Alltop, you'll find that they really have, this site was founded by Guy Kawasaki, by the way, and I, I feel like he owes me a, a check or something, because <laughs> I've talked about it a lot. You'll find that Alltop has a section for almost everything. Like just diving into health, they have a, a section for cystic fibrosis, um, cerebral palsy, any niche that you can think of, you'll probably find something there. And that's a great way, if you're creating a blog, like I mentioned in chapter one, get your blog in front of this audience and you will be able to, to socially network with all the people, all the thought leaders in that space. Addiction, that's. <laughs> so, under addiction, it showed I don't know how many lines I scrolled there, but I think it was about 40 some different blogs around addiction. So really, this is a, a place where it aggregates everything. So understanding what, um, what sites are aggregating the content that you want your startup to appear on or your, the media that you're producing, think about all top because it's a great way to get noticed. So the last thing I want to mention it, before I take any questions is that ShopBop is hiring. <laughs> we have almost 30 some job openings, mostly in Madison, a few in New York, and we're looking for very talented, smart people. And uh, just Google ShopBop careers and my email address is there. I'd love to take your questions. So if you could speak into the microphone. Uh, any questions? Okay, we have first one over here. Yeah, thank you. My question would be about time. Um, I own my own business and of, yes, this is all really cool. I could spend lots of time, but I have a family and <laughs> other right. things. So how do you suggest, I guess, or how do you manage time on spending it getting caught up in this? That, that's a really good question. And, and I think trying to enable other people or finding the people that are most passionate about something. Um, if you can create brand ambassadors around what you're doing, if you're a small business, it's, it's challenging. And I think if you were to do one thing and one thing only of, of all these different ideas, I'd just go out and create a Facebook page because it doesn't take much time it doesn't take much effort for other people to uh, join or become a fan of your Facebook page. You can probably at least get 10 to 20 fans with your family and close friends alone. <laughs> um, and it's pretty easy for you to update. You can update it from your phone. So yeah, I'd say do the Facebook page. I, my general advice is skip creating a web page for now. If you're, if you're strapped for time and money, creating a web page 
really does require some resources to both build and maintain, and creating a Facebook page is relatively easy, and it allows you to test ideas out. And you can post your idea there, or you could post it to Kickstarter, um, but let people poke holes in your startup or in your business, and that'll give you ways to build that business and make it better. Yes. Yeah, uh, with Facebook, just a, a question on, say you have 800 a billion users on Facebook, and you focus a lot on Facebook, but the data quality, when you start to data mine Facebook, mm -hmm. Let's just say that 30% of those folks are under the age of 21. Right. <laughs> and let's just say they're not truthful. That's a lot of people who are <laughs> basically not telling the truth about what they do, what their interests are. What's your commentary there? Because really, it's about data fidelity, data quality. That really bothers me a little bit. Obviously, you're not going to put a million dollar marketing campaign on <laughs> one source. But that particularly strikes me as being strange because you really could get a very distorted view of reality if you looked at Facebook data alone, yes? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Like, Facebook data is what it is. It has flaws because we all lie. <laughs> and um, we lie about our age, our relationship status. <laughs> However, it is free. So if you're not, if you're not spending any money and you, you just want to know how many people are into biomedical engineering because I want to put some ads in front of them, it can give you a ballpark, I, I would say. Because as, it, as you saw there, for the United States alone, it's, uh, it lists Facebook population as 145 million people. And we all know that the United States is, I don't know, closer to 300 million. So already, there's, there are people that aren't on Facebook. Um, and you're not going to reach them. But that is definitely a valid critic, critique. Hi, you had a lot of great ideas about um, establishing a web presence and understanding your customer. What about building relationships once you've already done that? Do you have anything to say about that? That, that requires, I think, a lot of time because to build relationships, there's no um, easy way. I think it's one, about being consistent with your messaging, and two, listening maybe four times as much as you speak. So think about the old ears mouth ratio and multiply it by two. When marketing more toward, uh, more business to business, how would you compare, say, Facebook to something more like LinkedIn, where businesses are trying to be socially active with other businesses? Yeah, I think I think LinkedIn is probably the right venue for that. Uh, I didn't dive too deep into LinkedIn because I don't have that much experience in it. Um, I think I had tested out LinkedIn for recruiting, and that seemed to be somewhat effective, but. I, I think go LinkedIn. One of the easiest, cheapest LinkedIn tips is that you can get on the Q&A boards. So like if people are asking questions about biomedical engineering, you can start answering those questions and become a thought leader within the LinkedIn community. Um, Tim, you mentioned something about trends. Was that that was a was it trends.com? It went oh, by so fast that page that you have displayed. That was uh, Google Trends. So google.com Google forward slash trends. I have a question yep. about that. Um, um, if you are starting a blog, or mm -hmm. you have a continu continuing blog or or more, um, is there some way to find out on in that in Google um, Trends um, what people are? most interest, I think you said controversial issues or subjects they're interested in, but um, is there a percentage breakdown about what people are interested in reading online, you know, on blogs and such? Um, yeah. I, I, so you can hit the right market or whatever, the readership, um, and it might change, too. I'd like to know how, you know, the, if you can um, gauge that. So give me a controversy, and I'll walk through one. Sex? <laughs> Religion? Um, Okay. Politics? That's a good one. <laughs> Politics. I can name a lot. <laughs> I was going to say, everybody agrees on sex. <laughs> okay, politics then. <laughs> um, oh, I got to take off the sports filter. <laughs> good idea. Although, yeah. pretty interesting, you got a couple hit 
Insights there. Yeah. <laughs> so what Google Insights is telling me, telling me is what I think is really interesting there is the forecast there. So it sees, it's, it's capturing our domestic dialogue about contraception and it's seeing that there's, it's predicting a peak and it also recognizes that there's been a surge in popularity in the last couple weeks. Um, and so far as regional interest, I think it's really fascinating that Senegal's there, number one, in, in part because they've, been a, they've had a recent, um, I think, kerfuffle, political kerfuffle around contraception and the church. But also, when you look at regional interest, and then I think the search terms is where you're getting at. So when, if you were going to write a blog post about contraception, and you wanted to know what are people really, really excited about or, or interested in, engaged in, these are some of the topics that could give you blog post ideas. Yeah, um, I was interested that somebody asked a question about uh, LinkedIn because I find that to be the site of preference, at least in my case, to use for uh, issues involving uh, business and professional matters. Um, I'm one of what I think is a growing group of people that refuse to have anything to do with Facebook for various reasons, including a lot of their very poor customer service practices and also just the overall extremely sophomoric and immature nature of the whole Facebook uh, presentation. So I, I guess that's my point. I would think that LinkedIn would be the natural to use for people with the interest in uh, business or commercial or professional matters. And then another point, another site that might be of interest to explore for uh, market research is a relatively new one that I've stumbled across known as Quora, which is a, essentially a very sophisticated discussion group among people with some degree of education about any topic you can name, uh, places, people, politics, sex, subjects, but I mean it's all from a much more mature level than say Facebook. So that would be another one that I think bears exploring for possibly market research applications. Is there a website at all too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not logged in though. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's some actual questions about ShopOff in Quora <laughs> that I saw a while back oh. which intrigued me. So social media has matured in the past few years, but the mobile web is like on the verge of exploding, but it's still in its infancy. So how do you prepare for that? Well, so Facebook's biggest weakness in their IPO, um, in their filing, if you read it carefully, they say that the biggest threat to their business is that they don't have a mobile, advertise, mobile revenue plan. And increasingly, we're all consuming this Facebook content on our phones, and Facebook can put four or five ads on your Facebook page, but users will not tolerate more than one ad on their Facebook app and their iPhone. So I think that um, you know your strategy sort of, if you want to go the Facebook advertising route, it sort of evolves with the Facebook strategy. Um, until then, if you want to do any advertising on mobile devices, you're kind of limited to Apple's iAds or Google, or um, there's a couple small third party players as well. You didn't, you didn't spend a lot of time talking about Twitter. Do you want to comment about Twitter and its current role? Yeah, um, so this is the shop off Twitter page. And we use it, I think, I think the, the current role of Twitter for people is to some degree networking, but also having a public dialogue. And uh, for us, you know, we post things that we like on the site. We talk about our lookbooks or you know, if we're at an event at Fashion Week, we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, we handle some customer service things, like if somebody says, oh, my package is lost, or I can't find it, where do I, where do I go? We'll respond to those people. But I think Twitter, I, I feel like Twitter's waning um, and being replaced by other sites, as people lost, have lost interest or they've been over-tweeted. Um, you just spoke about Twitter waning. I'm curious, I mean, obviously Facebook, or MySpace, very rapidly, like overnight, just kind of went downhill. Um, I'm curious if you, if you kind of throw all your eggs in one basket with Facebook, are you worried that that might also have the same effect? Yeah, I, I do. Um, because we all saw what happened to uh, your MySpace page. Just people stopped going to it, and everybody left sort of en masse. So I, I think that's where email 
building your email list if you're building a business really comes in handy because I can't see people giving up email in the next five years or so. Maybe 10 years. Hi, I'm uh, really curious to hear you talk about your Instagram because I'm not really familiar with like brands using it besides personal use. And then um, what can you tell us about uh, your thoughts on Google Plus? Um, so Google Plus, I think the most interesting thing with Google Plus is just understanding that Google will stop at nothing <laughs> at this point to, to compete with Facebook. And this is my, I'm personally logged in as me here. And when I search for ShopBop, this is what I see. So being a follower of ShopBop and Google Plus exposes me to things that if uh, anybody else in this room searches for ShopBop, they're not going to see. Unless, of course, you all become Google Plus fans, which is really the goal of this session. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the reason that Google Plus matters is because Google is going to make it matter to marketers. They're going to make it matter to, uh, to anybody that uses Google. And they're, they're sort of forcing their way into a, a conversation, I feel. But you can, for that reason, you can't ignore them. Uh, regarding Instagram, I'm somewhat new to Instagram. Um, there's a, we have a, a pretty strong fan base, actually, that people just posting things to Instagram and tagging it as shop up, like something that they bought, that they unboxed, that they loved, that they saw on the site. Um, and we do some Instagramming ourselves, but there's a lot of it that's really just organic um, popularity that we haven't tried to create. Yes. I was just curious how many people you have following the ShopBot page on uh, Google Plus. Oh, it's very small. So. Which is kind of the conundrum of Google Plus is that Google owns the universe. It's the party that nobody came to. Exactly. But so we're, we're currently at 166 followers. I, I, I'm expecting to see that jump to 350. <laughs> and I also wanted to ask you if you had used Pinterest yet um, as a promotional tool. Um, we've started to think about Pinterest more. We're, we're more interested, I think. And um, there's actually a, a shop op employee who a year ago started pinning stuff, and she was a graphic designer. And now she is in the top 10 of the most followed Pinterest users. So ShopBop, to some degree, our, the, the content that ShopBop creates happened to be very popular with the Pinterest audience. So it was a very good alignment, I think, of what the community is interested in and what we're creating. Hi, Tim. I'm, uh, I'm interested in what um, some of your successful campaigns are with these social media sites to bridge the gap to actually bring these customers to the shop op site and make purchases. Um, I think one of the most interesting campaigns that we did was maybe two years ago, and it was with, we worked with a lot of bloggers, and we had a sketch artist that came in and did a rendition of, um, all of the different bloggers, and that was immensely popular because I think the, um, the blogosphere just engaged it, and they, they, they took it, they ran with it. Everybody reposted the, the pictures of themselves that the sketch artist had done. The artist's name was Dallas Shaw, and I think she, um, I think she, she lives down south, but I think that was probably one of the most successful things that we've done. Well, I'd like all of you to join me in thanking Tim for this. Uh, thank you.